This is Money Guide with Mary Stirk from Stirk Financial Services. Now, here's Mary Stirk. Welcome to Money Guide with Mary Stirk. And today we are talking about the back to school special, saving for college. <laughs> today with me, I have Kelsey Banky. Kelsey's a CFB in our office and works with lots of families with um, saving for and then coming time to distribute money for college when your youngsters get to that age. Absolutely. This is a this is a fun topic because as exciting as college can be, there's a big bill that comes with it. So yes, there let's is. figure out how to make that a little less of an impact. I am very aware of that big bill because I have recently become an empty nester. <laughs> My youngest son just went to college at University of Colorado at Boulder, which um, comes with a pretty significant bill. <laughs> and fortunately, his father and I had the foresight to start saving for college when he was very young and, um, you know, have most of that covered. So that's a really nice place to be sitting. But I recognize not everybody is in that position. And if you have children that are young or if you have grandchildren that are young, we want to talk to you about what are some of the good ways to save for college so that when that college bill hits your desk, you don't have a heart attack. <laughs> It's just getting bigger and bigger, too. So I can only imagine a decade and a half or so when my son gets to that, what the bill's going to be. It just, I'm blown away at how much it's grown. Yeah. Like the truth of it is that the cost of sending someone to an out of state public university is like buying a house. I mean, that's the reality of it. Mm -hmm. It's like buying a house for their education. So, I mean, there's a lot of debate about whether or not that's necessary, whether or not, you know, degrees from bigger schools actually give you advantages that degrees from smaller schools or lesser known universities don't give you. But ultimately, at the end of the day, whatever you decide in terms of going to college, there's no doubt about the fact that oftentimes a college degree can create opportunities for people that they might not have otherwise had. And so that's why we think that it's important to talk about how to save for it. Yep, let's do it. All right, so one of the biggest things that people are aware of out there for saving for college is something called a 529 plan. Some people call them 529 plans. I call them 529 plans. But they are basically designated to be college savings, okay? Now, the thing about a 529 plan is that they are connected to a state. It's kind of interesting how they work, but almost every state has a 529 plan, but every 529 plan out there is connected to one of the states. It doesn't matter what state's plan you use, and it doesn't matter what state you go to college in, all the rules still apply. But the thing about it being connected to a state that is important is that you might be able to get some level of state tax deduction if you're contributing to the state program that you live in. Okay. So, for instance, in the state of Iowa, where a lot of our listeners are, then there is a small tax deduction that you can get if you contribute to the Iowa 529 plan. I mean, it's not huge, but and every little bit And it's helps. subject to your income <laughs> level, yeah. Yes. But exactly, uh, if, if you can get a little bit, that's just more that you can save then. Right. Now, there's two types of 529 plans. There's college savings plans and there's prepaid tuition plans. <laughs> And I'm just going to go on record and saying we're not going to spend a lot of time with the prepaid tuition plans because they're not as common and, and they're they're not as common for a reason is because they don't provide quite as many benefits as what just the regular college savings programs do. They're a little more restrictive as opposed to the other type of 529 plans uh, are very flexible, actually. Right. Um, so much so that you pick a beneficiary when you open the account, but you can always change the beneficiary or the child who's getting the um, money to use uh, down the road, which is a really nice feature for people with multiple children or multiple grandchildren. Yeah, that's huge. So key into that, if you're listening, is that the flexibility in a 529 plan is massive. So let's just say you have four kids and you have one 529 plan. And let's say your oldest child decides not to go to college. You can take the money in that and you can just change the name of the child that it's connected to 
There's no tax consequences of doing that. And by changing the beneficiary on that, it ensures that all the tax benefits of the 529 stay in place, but it still is used within your family. And the beauty of it is, is let's say that your children don't use it all. You can save it for grandchildren. You can go back to school yourself. You can change that beneficiary to anybody in your family. Okay, and and that means that whatever you've put into here, as long as it's used for education, anyone in your family can benefit from it. Now, be aware there is in many states a maximum number of times during a one year period that you can change the beneficiary or change your allocation inside the plan. (laughs) So they have a few little rules that are unique to them that way. But Kelsey, let's talk for a minute about why somebody would use a 529, like the main benefit of the 529 plan itself. So 529 plans really have a great tax um, treatment. Contributions made into the plan are after-tax contributions. So you don't get, you might get that state deduction, but uh, you do not get a federal deduction. And some states don't offer that option for a state deduction. So assuming you put them in then after tax, no tax um, treatment on the front end, if those funds and the earnings that those funds have, if they are used for qualified educational expenses at an accredited college or university, then you can get those earnings out tax free, which if you start that 529 plan when those kiddos are little and you have a lot of time behind it, that can be a huge, huge benefit for you. Absolutely. So hear us saying that the primary benefit of it is that the account grows tax deferred and comes out tax free if it's used for qualified higher education expense. And I don't know about you listening out there, but tax free is my favorite kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so, okay. So if it doesn't get used for higher education, then the earnings will be taxed when they come out and you will have a 10% federal penalty on just the earnings. So there's a little bit of teeth involved if you don't use it for higher education, but that's where we go back to that flexibility that if one kid doesn't use it, maybe somebody else in your family will. Yes, and you do want to pay it because of that that one point that it does have to be used for qualified education expenses. You do want to pay attention to your funding. Um, some people just want to throw as much money as they possibly can in there. And and that might make sense if you're pretty confident your kids are going to go to college. But, y- you know, that might not be the case. And so then diversifying how you're saving a little bit might be a good thing for you as well. Right now, here's what's really, really cool about the 529 is that while there are limits of how much you can put into it each year, The 529 plan has an accelerated gifting strategy available inside of it. And so I want to talk to you out there, grandparents who might be listening. If you have money that you want to contribute to a grandchild or gift to a grandchild, this could be an amazing way to do it. So in a 529 plan, an individual can actually accelerate their gifting And in 2017, you can actually put up to $70,000 into a 529 in one year and avoid any type of federal gift tax. Now, you have to make a special tax election that says that you've treated the gift as been having made in equal installments, but the 529 plan has that provision that you can smush it in there at the, you know, in one lump, which gives it the opportunity to grow, right? If you're married, you could do $140,000. So higher net worth people hear me when I'm saying this could be a great way to transition money down to your grandchildren while avoiding federal gift tax and also set up in a way that it's benefiting them if they're doing what you want them to be doing, which is getting an education. (laughs) So that's really important. Now, the, the, the other thing about it, too, is that the 529 plan is set up where there is an owner of it and then there's a beneficiary right so the owner might be mom or dad or the owner might be the grandparent but the beneficiary is the child okay so from a strategic planning standpoint if you are a grandparent who's going to make a significant contribution to a 529 plan it's usually a better option for you to have the you be the owner and then the grandchild be the beneficiary. Because my understanding of the way that the FAFSA rules are when you go to file for financial aid, 529 money that has the parent as the owner is treated as 
countable in a formula, but 529 money that a grandparent owns might not be countable in the formula. Absolutely. And that FAFSA, for anybody that's not there yet, no, we'll find out that is the the live and die document right. that decides a lot about their financial aid package. So um, there's things that you can do prior to getting to that point. Um, basically good decisions and not as good decisions. And if you can make more of those good decisions, it can make that FAFSA come out um, even better. Yeah, I'm all for being able to borrow money. I'm all for free money. But if you're higher net worth, you know, you're really not going to have an opportunity to get that. But what you might have an opportunity to get is loans that don't have to be charging interest until the child is graduated, mm-hmm. right? And then that's going to give you more flexibility, and, and that's a great thing to have too. Congratulations to Mary Stirk and the team at Stirk Financial for earning a spot on two Forbes lists for six years running, including 2023 Forbes Best in State Wealth Advisors and 2023 Forbes Top Women Wealth Advisors Best in State, number one in South Dakota. Welcome back to Money Guide with Mary Stark. And today we're talking about back to school specials of saving for college. So we've talked about 529 plans. And now I want to talk briefly about using um, a couple of other different things that are out there to save for college. One of them is called a Coverdell Education Savings Account. Sometimes they're called an ESA Education Savings Account. Sometimes they're called a CSA, a Coverdell Savings Account. But whatever that it is, that's what we're talking about. Now, these came out before the 529s did. And the 529, by and large, replaced them in how people are using them because the 529 is more flexible. But the The Coverdell education account has a couple things that are unique to it that are different than the 529 that we want to talk about. The biggest one is that the Coverdell accounts can be used for expenses for elementary and secondary school. So you can actually use Coverdell accounts for K through 12, whereas the 529 plan is 100% for higher education. Okay, so... The um, contribution rules are different, too. There's a maximum annual limit of $2,000. So in any given year, you can only put $2,000 per beneficiary in. You and your spouse can both give to a beneficiary, so you can get $4,000 in. But obviously, as you can see with what we just talked about with the 529 plan before, you can't stuff as much money into them. Um, The tax treatment, though, is the same. It's tax deferred, and you... um, You know, if you withdraw it, then it's tax-free when you withdraw it. Um, Same type of penalty if you take it out and it's not for education. You have taxes plus the 10% penalty. Um, But the interesting thing about this is not everyone can even open a Coverdell account. Your ability to contribute to this is completely dependent upon your modified adjusted gross income. (laughs) So if you have an income of more than $95,000 or joint of $190,000, this is off the table. You can't even go into it. It's kind I of think, interesting. And I think that's a big reason why you don't see them as much anymore. Mm-hmm. The The 529 plans, anyone, regardless of income level, can open them. They yes. do have a contribution limit, but there's they're not uh, unavailable to anybody. They're available to absolutely everyone. And the, the Coverdells, there's just so many... Uh, pieces to them that are limiting that we just don't see them as often anymore. But they are out there. Yep. Okay, so another way that people often save for college is inside the cash value of life insurance plans. And the reason that people do this is to retain flexibility of those assets. Now, the um, the theory with doing this is if you contribute to the cash value of a life insurance plan, let's say that you over-contribute to it and build up a cash stash, if you want to take a loan for yourself from that policy, then you can. And as a policy loan, you're also potentially creating a tax-favored environment for yourself. Now, this strategy only works if you actually need life insurance (laughs) and if you're going to overfund the heck out of it, meaning you're not just making minimum payments. You need to be using it as a cash accumulation vehicle. So this strategy can absolutely work for some people. And what I want to share is that I personally have used a combination of strategies to save for college for my kids. So I used a 529 plan for some of it, and I used the cash value of life insurance for some of it. 
And oftentimes a combination approach gives us some flexibility. And here's why I think this is important. I have three children. I have one grandchild. I right now have two children that are in college. <laughs> one is traditional student. One's a non-traditional student. My, I have one kid that went to college and then stopped and then went to college and then stopped. And I think that's a pretty common experience with a lot of listeners out there. So the 529, since it can only be used for school, what if I had all my eggs in one basket, right? And, I, and everything was in there and then none of my kids went to college. I wouldn't have the flexibility to be able to utilize it for something else. But that money and the cash value of the, ret- of the life insurance policy, if my kids don't use it for college, I can pivot and use it for another purpose, like early retirement <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. So it, it's nice to have kind of a flexible option along with something that's geared towards higher education as a bit of a combination approach. So think about that when you're building out your own strategy. Now, another way that you can save that's um, more of that flexible approach without wrapping it into life insurance is by using something called a custodial account. And so before there were 529s or before there were education savings account, we had these custodial accounts and they're called UGMAs or (laughs) UTMAs. It's like Uniform Gift to Minors Act is an UGMA. And it's like, okay, that's kind of silly, but that's what they are. And so, Kelsey, share with us a little bit about why would somebody use a custodial account instead of a college account? Custodial accounts have even more flexibility. They have no connection to have to be used for college. So it's just a way for um, assets to be held in a child's name. They do have to have a custodian on them as somebody who's monitoring and Mm -hmm. acting on their behalf because children can't enter into contracts themselves. (coughs) Excuse me. And uh, it's a way for their assets to be invested uh, virtually for just about anything that they want to use it for in the future. Now, there is a hitch on this that they will get the assets in their own personal name when they reach the age of majority. And some parents um, might not want that to happen. So keep in mind, any dollars you put in there are technically their dollars at that point that they reach majority. Some states it's 18, some states it's 21, um, and they can then do whatever they want with them. So uh, having good financial education for your child up to that point would be important. Yeah, so the thing that I really want you to key in with that is that technically that money is theirs as a child, not yours. And so as a custodian, you have a responsibility to take care of it for them. So, you know, you could fall into a situation where let's say that your child knew you had a custodial account and when they turn 18, they could figure out that they are supposed to get control of that money and they can force that issue and use that money. And you lose control of it when they reach age of majority if they force that issue. So that's part of the reason that some of these other education accounts was created was to avoid that issue from happening. So. Yeah, because once a kid gets control of it, there there's responsible ones out there, but there's a <laughs> lot that aren't really ready to be responsible at, the, at that supposed age of majority. So the other uh, tricky thing knows. about the custodial accounts is that um, the the taxes on them are kind of wonky. So the first amount of taxes is tax at your child's rate, and if they don't pay taxes, you can avoid that. But then the next amount of taxes is tax at your rate. And what I can tell you is that I have seen people get audited on their taxes for no other reason than that their custodial accounts are flagging something weird. And I've seen more people get audited because they just happen to have a custodial account, even if they're doing everything right with it. So I kind of have a little bias away from that because I've seen so many audits hit because of that, that I don't like them as much from a tax perspective because I think you can create a red flag where one doesn't necessarily need to be. So... Okay, so let's um, talk a little bit about, for our grandparents out there, how you can help your grandchildren with college costs, okay? A lot of people want to do this. Now, obviously, you can go ahead and make an outright cash gift to your grandchild. (laughs) They won't hate that. (laughs) Neither will their parents, most likely. So that's something that you can do. And Kelsey, share with us what that amount is that you can give if you're just going to do a straight cash gift. For individuals, $14,000 per year. For married couples, $28,000 a year is the limit. Um, and this is definitely an option that you can you can go with. There are some 
reasons why this might not be the most optimal option for you from taxes in part that that is counted in the income of the child. And as we said before, the FAFSA form is going to be looking at their income, going to be looking at their assets to determine what kind of financial aid they're eligible for and what kind of loans they're eligible for. Um, so that is something that can have a really great impact to, to go against the bill, but might prevent them from getting access to other things that right. could also help them. So uh, some people might be at a high enough income that that doesn't even matter. It's not going to be a factor, but there's other ways that you could also donate money to them um, to their education expenses, such as paying it directly to the institution, doing it that way. If, the, if your intent is that that money is going to be used for their education, paying it directly to the institution might have a better option for you um, because that is not going to factor anywhere in the child's income or taxes. So um, gets the same thing accomplished, but it's just a little bit more tax favored way. Right. And here's <laughs> what most people don't know is that under federal law, tuition payments made directly to a college are not considered taxable gifts, no matter how large they are. So think about that for just a minute. If you're going to give them cash, you're limited. But if you're going to just pay the college directly, it's unlimited. That's huge. But there's restrictions. The only thing that you can cover is tuition. The room and board, the books, the fees, the equipment, computers, and things like that, that is not something that falls under this tax loophole of being fully able to pay without creating any kind of taxable event. But the tuition itself is. So that's something that grandparents should really keep in mind. Now, how do you pay for those other things if that's the route you're going to go? Those kind of things can be covered in most years by the 529 plane expenses. So a combination of those yep. two strategies can really set your child or grandchild up to uh, have minimal expenses or minimal um, loans coming out of that if, if the money's there to pay for those things. So we hope this has been eye-opening for you. We hope this has been helpful when you're thinking about saving for college for your own child or your own grandchild. And uh, since it's back to school season, we think that this was an effective topic. If you would like to get a college cost forecast to kind of estimate what you're up against in terms of how much college might cost, and just give us a call. We're going to give away five forecasts to people that call that want us to forecast that out and to give you an idea of how much you really need to be saving in order to cover that tuition and, and college bill. So thanks for listening to Money Guide with Mary Stirk. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of your audio provider and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities or services mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. No strategy can ensure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information should only be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Securities and investment advisory services are offered through Woodbury Financial Services Incorporated. Member FINRA SIPC. Insurance offered through Sterk Financial Services, which is not affiliated with Woodbury Financial Services Incorporated. Neither Woodbury Financial Services Incorporated nor its representatives provide tax or legal advice. You should consult a qualified attorney or tax professional to answer your specific questions. Sterk Financial Services is located at 350 Oak Tree Lane, Suite 150, Dakota Dunes, South Dakota, 57049, and can be reached at 605 217 3555. Forbes Best in State Wealth Advisors list includes 10 recipients per state. The award is based on qualitative and quantitative data. Rating thousands of wealth advisors with a minimum of seven years of experience and weighing factors like revenue trends, assets under management, compliance records, industry experience, and best practices. The award is not based on portfolio performance or client reviews. There is no fee in exchange for rankings. Third-party rankings and recognitions are no guarantee of future investment success and do not ensure that a client or prospective client will experience a higher level of performance or results. These ratings should not be construed as an endorsement of the advisor by any client nor are they representative of any one client's evaluation.